Hello, we are finally live. Thank you so much for your patience. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Martin Barr Stephen Wilson very virtual lecture. We are in for a very special presentation today entitled A Lawyer's Prescription for Achieving Health Equity by Dean and Dr. Dana Bowen Matthew. But before we get started, I want to take a moment to talk about this lecture's namesakes, Martin Barr and Stephen Wilson. Both of these former deans were visionaries of our college who believed in bringing learned academicians and high profile experts like Dr. Matthew to this college and this campus to highlight the development of healthcare policies, laws and ethics with the ultimate goal of elevating the quality of patient care. Stephen Wilson was the college's second dean serving from 1953 until his death when Martin Barr stepped up from his role as professor and chair of our Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Dr. Barr then spent nearly three decades serving, recruiting, advising and leading us at Wayne State University most of the time at the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. But truth be told, Dr. Barr probably spent seven decades helping others in the health professions. This lecture series was established in recognition of his leadership and his desire to make sure that we never lost sight of our responsibility to disseminate the most timely and relevant insights for healthcare professionals, practitioners, educators. We lost Stephen Wilson in 1963 and Marty Barr in 2018, but I am confident that they are with us today in support of our, of our discussions. Dr. Matthew's talk on achieving health equity is timely, relevant, and of critical concern. And today especially, I want to extend a warm welcome to several members of Dr. Barr's family. We are thrilled to host this lecture, and we are so pleased that you can join us today. Now, quickly, logistics. Uh, that's important, as you saw, uh, sitting waiting patiently before we began. I think we're over our little technical bumps and we're ready for a great ride. But regarding logistics, I want everyone to know that Dr. Matthew will be presenting for approximately 45 minutes up until 5.30, and then we'll have approximately 25 minutes for questions. And if you have a question, you will see an email on your screen and at any point during the presentation, please email your question into that email and that is mrossman at uh, wayne.edu and that question will pop up to me and I will pose that question on your behalf in the Q&A section to follow her presentation. But now uh, at this time, I would like to introduce to you President of Wayne State University, M. Roy Wilson. And Dr. Wilson is with us uh, in voice and in a still photograph today. I, I do apologize uh, around these technical uh, uh, little bumps, but we're so delighted that we have President Wilson with us. In addition to being our president, M. Roy Wilson is a Harvard trained medical doctor, epidemiologist and health disparities researcher. With a career long focus on minority health, including prominent leadership positions at the NIH, he has led our university to redouble its commitment to combating the challenging chronic conditions that include heart disease and diabetes that affect Detroiters at disproportionately higher rates than US averages. And I would add, most recently, he is our fearless leader in the battle of COVID and his expertise and reassurance on campus and in a broader community is so appreciated. So I am delighted, very pleased to have you with us today, President Wilson, as we explore this important topic. President Wilson. Thank you very much, Kathy. I'm, I'm gonna keep this very short because I know we're running a little bit uh, behind schedule. It, it really is a uh, pleasure to be part of this. Some of you may or may not know, but I uh, have known uh, Dr. Dana Bowen Matthews for uh, quite a while, maybe about 15 years or so. So um, 
you know, I can't take any credit for any of her amazing successes, but uh, I did know her when she was a, uh, let's just say, a, a mid-level faculty member at the University of Colorado when I was a chancellor of the University of Colorado Health Science Center. So I take some bit of a point of pride in seeing her uh, successes over the years. And, and she really is a dynamo. I'm just so sorry that you won't be able to see her uh, in action face-to-face uh, -face because she's uh, uh, tremendous. Um, as many of you know, I was um, appointed to the uh, Governor Whitmer's Task Force to uh, look at the uh, racial disparities in COVID-19 in terms of both the um, uh, contracting of the disease and in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. And one of the amazing things is that between uh, when that was occurring to the fall, we really saw that these disparities were, uh, these racial disparities were effectively uh, eliminated. Uh, now, certainly, I don't want to minimize the, you know, this at, at, at all or trivialize it. You know, certainly, um, the high incidence of uh, COVID-19 and the uh, rapidity at which uh, outcomes um, are manifested is very different from uh, studying uh, chronic disease in which outcomes can take uh, years and sometimes uh, decades. And so don't want to tri trivialize the challenges. But what this has, has taught me is that health disparities don't have to exist, that there are ways to, to mitigate it. And uh, I think that is a, a very, very hopeful me a message. Uh, I just want to thank Dr. Matthew for joining us this afternoon. Um, like I said, I, you know, we go back a long ways. I want to congratulate her on her, uh, her newest position. Last time I saw her, she was at the University of Virginia. So um, I haven't seen her since she's uh, uh, been the, 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 her new position at, as, as dean. So uh, congratulations. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, you talk. Good to see you, Dana. <laughs> So much, President Wilson. And now on to our main event. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dana Bowen Matthew, Dean of George Washington University Law School. She is the first woman to lead George Washington Law. Dr. Matthew is a recognized lawyer nationally, and she's a legal scholar and expert in health equity and public health policy, and brings a passion for public service. She holds a BA in economics from Harvard Radcliffe College, a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, and a PhD in health and behavioral sciences from the University of Colorado, Denver. Before her deanship at GW Law, Dr. Matthew was at the University of Virginia as distinguished professor of law, research professor of civil liberties and human rights, and professor of public health sciences. She was also the director of their equity center, which builds relationships between the university and its surrounding community to address racial and social inequalities. That sounds a lot like Wayne State University too. In the policy world, Dr. Matthew has served as the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow for our own US Senator, Debbie Stabenow, and as senior advisor in the EPA's Office of Civil Rights. She's also a non-resident fellow in the Center for Health Policy at the Brookings Institution. And she still has time to write. She has bylines on dozens of book chapters and articles on healthcare reform, public health law, health disparities, patient protection, antitrust laws, and civil rights. And I encourage all of you, especially our students, to read her outstanding book, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in American Healthcare. We are absolutely thrilled to host Dr. Dana Bowen Matthew today virtually, and I would hope someday in person on our campus. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dean Dana Bowen Matthew. What a wonderful and warm welcome. So I want to make sure that two things are true. One, that you can hear me, and two, that you can see my agenda slide for the day before I begin. I wonder, since I don't have a view of anyone in the room or on the screen, if someone could give me a signal that both are true. Yes. Excellent. And you are seeing my 
main slide, not my presenter view. Is that correct? Yeah. Excellent. Well, first, I want to begin by saying thank you to Dr. Wilson. I have known Dr. Wilson for quite some time, but I was hoping he would not put a number to it because now you have an idea of how old I am, which I am trying hard to fight. Um, I will also want to thank especially uh, Dr. Lacrati, who I just cannot tell you how many conversations we had um, planning and thinking through what I might say. All of the material, of course, is mine, but the invitation was so gracious and so warm. I, I am very, very honored to be here uh, for this uh, prestigious lecture. And of course, Dean, thank you for the wonderful introduction uh, that you've just given me. There are days in this new position as Dean that I wish I had recorded that introduction so that I can remind myself um, that I was good at a few things uh, before I dove into this uh, new business of being a Dean in a pandemic. But I will tell you that one of the joys is being able to return to my substantive research and the love of, uh, of, of my scholarly life is looking at ways to do exactly what President uh, Wilson talked about, and that is look for ways to reduce, even eradicate uh, health disparities. So let's get to it. I honestly believe it's possible. And uh, I have many, many things to say uh, to suggest that we might be a part of the solution together. Uh, so I'll speak today in four parts. Um, I'm going to use the COVID-19 pandemic as a, a setup for uh, the theoretical frame of my, uh, of my comments. Uh, structural inequality uh, is, in my view, the threat to health uh, of, of populations, not only vulnerable populations, but all populations. And that theoretical frame is part one. I will overlay that with race in particular, and I am going to go ahead and dive in and use that dreaded word racism. I'll define it, hopefully removing some of the dread and fear, and then uh, pivot to a more pragmatic part of the discussion, and that is to talk about the role of pharmacies, uh, pharmacists, uh, academic uh, colleges of pharmacy in healing this structural inequality and maybe close with some steps uh, that we might take next. So first, some level setting. Uh, this is a meme that I'm confident is very familiar to the entire audience. I am a lawyer, as you've heard. Uh, kudos to you for having the temerity and the courage to invite a lawyer in your midst. Uh, we deal in equality. That is a part of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. It is a part of what is written over the Supreme Court's door, equal justice under the law. And so equality is the principle uh, that lawyers are uh, dedicated to uh, advancing and enforcing. Ah, uh, but we cannot speak in terms of equality in health. This meme is intended to level set our conversation. I am talking about equality of opportunity. I am not talking about equality of outcomes, that would be impossible. But because I am talking about equality of opportunity, I am looking to achieve health equity. And health equity I define as everyone having a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Now, where does that intersect with law? That will be a theme of my comments. We achieve health equity by eliminating what is unjust, unfair, and avoidable. Those are the things that are unequal. And therefore, again, my principal theoretical assertion today is that inequality is the greatest threat to health equity in America and in the world. I want to spend just a, a few more minutes uh, uh, looking at uh, the evidence that suggests that my assertion is true. Uh, two slides will do this, I believe. Uh, the first on the left is a, uh, a record of the Gini index, G-I-N-I. It's an index that the World Bank and most researchers use in order to describe the income inequality in a society. So the difference between the earnings of the top quintile and the bottom quintile is translated into an index, as you see on the 
uh, x-axis. And on the y-axis, you see a series of countries, the United States on the far left, the United Kingdom on the far right, and the differences in the income top to bottom, the haves and the have nots, if you will, uh, determines how high your country's Gini index will be. Well, here you have the OECD nations, the developed nations uh, from 2000 to 2017. And you see, unsurprisingly, that the widest gap between top and bottom income earners in this group of nations is in the United States. Taking that information to the right-hand side of the graph, I am taking this graph, uh, the second plot, from an article by Pickard and Wilkerson. They have created an index, which is uh, shown on the left-hand side of the second graph. And the index combines 10 indicators or metrics of health outcomes. So it would be uh, disparities in heart disease deaths, diabetes deaths, deaths due to cerebral uh, 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 to stroke, um, uh, some other uh, social indices in, uh, in disparities uh, for education, 10 altogether. They are combined into an index. And from the bottom of the, uh, of the y-axis, where those indices are better, uh, to the top where the indices are low, you can see plotted against the income inequality as measured by the Gini index that I refer to on the left-hand graph. Here's the story. There is a direct and positive relationship between inequality in a society and health outcomes. There is a direct and positive relationship between inequality in a society and social outcomes. And we can predict those with alarming accuracy and we should all be alarmed to see what the prediction is. On the lower left, you see the nation of Japan, followed by Sweden, Norway, Finland, and so forth. They have low income inequality and correspondingly low, uh, uh, excuse me, better health outcomes and social outcomes than the nation in the top right-hand corner, the outlier, the United States. Not only are we this society with the greatest inequality between income earners at the top quintile and bottom in qu quintile, but that correlates, sadly, with the worst health and social outcomes according to this index. This is to say that structural inequality, by structural I mean institutions throughout society, family, economic, government, criminal justice, and so forth, institutions throughout society organize people along the spectrum of their earnings, of their social class, of their social economic status. That stratification along a continuum not only places people in relative positions academically or absolutely, it also places them relative to one another in a position to enjoy the rewards of society, the opportunities of society, education, wealth, employment, recreation, and so forth. This is a stable system. It replicates throughout many institutions. Hence, it is structural. Structural inequality is associated positively and uh, to our detriment with, uh, uh, with health outcomes and social outcomes. That's the theoretical frame. Let me tell you a brief story to tell you why this matters. This is a story I tell often in almost every presentation because it drives home the point that I want to ask you to hold on to for the entirety of this presentation. Uh, fast forward to the moral of the story, and that is that place matters. So what you're looking at is the photograph from January 9th, 2009. Uh, credit to Thomas Leviste for this idea. Uh, but it's a daily news photograph of US Airways plane flight 1549. It left New York uh, to go to Charlotte, North Carolina, but did not make it. On the ascent, the plane ran into a gaggle of geese and reported to the tower in New Jersey that the bird strike meant that all 155 souls had to land on the Hudson River. Now remember, this is January 2009. The Hudson River is below freezing. Uh, Captain Chelsea Sullenberger, a movie was made about him by the name of Sully, you probably know the story, uh, was able to save all 155 story, uh, souls. It's a feel-good story, uh, but what I want to bring out in this photograph is the fact that there are two distinct groups of people that have left the plane and are waiting rescue outside of US Airways flight 1549. Do you see them? 
In the back of the plane is the largest group of people. This group of people is standing on the wing and you can see from those who are at the very edge of the wing that the water has begun to creep up around their ankles, that they are standing on a wing that is sinking. They will, if rescue does not happen quickly, be in the freezing Hudson before very long. I would contrast those people to those in the front. The smaller group of people on both the sides of the front nose of the plane are in life rafts. This small group of people have on life jackets. This small group of people have likely got little ration uh, uh, boxes uh, with some food that allows them uh, some sustenance and, and possibly uh, they won't have to eat each other if rescue doesn't come quickly. Uh, they have flares they can wave down for help, uh, for help if you will. Uh, but here's why they are in a better position. They have better life chances than the larger group in the back. And it's because of where they sat on the plane. Place matters. Place matters. Those who were in first class have a better chance at ex uh, exceeding the life expectancy of those who were in coach and sat in the back of the plane uh, where their resources, uh, their opportunities, and their life chances were relatively poorer. Please remember this photograph, Place Matters. I want to turn now uh, to part one. I'd like to use the COVID-19 pandemic that we are hopefully turning the corner on now uh, to talk about a special brand of structural inequality, right? Structural inequality is the theoretical frame I've just introduced. I wanna talk about it overlaid with race and racism in America. So these data are very familiar to you. If you're like me, you look at them daily. Uh, we now have over 30 million cases uh, of, of confirmed cases of uh, the coronavirus disease in the United States, COVID-19, uh, a total of 554,000 people have died of the COVID-19 disease. Let's stratify those people by race and you begin to see what I mean by structural racism. If you are Native American, that's American Indian, Alaska Native, non-Hispanic, then you have almost two times the probability of being diagnosed with COVID, nearly four times the probability of being hospitalized with COVID, and nearly two and a half times the probability of a white person non-Hispanic in the United States. You see similar multiples, not as dramatic, uh, for Black and African Americans and for Latino populations. This is an evidence of the structural nature of the morbidity and mortality inequality uh, that the COVID virus has visited upon our country. This is familiar to you. You are also familiar that in the earliest part of the pandemic, we saw a disproportionately high morbidity and mortality among these underrepresented minority populations, especially in large cities. New York was the hotspot. Los Angeles, Chicago, we saw a disproportionate number of deaths relative to the population uh, for these minority groups. This is an example of why we consider geography so important. Remember, place matters, uh, flight 1549. Geography so important to how disease distributes itself in the United States. So these were the places that were the start of the uh, pandemic where the hotspots began. Let's choose New York to look a little bit more closely at what I mean by structural inequality. Uh, and ultimately I mean that structural inequality by race or structural racism, as you'll see. So in New York, hospitalizations, uh, infections, death, and age adjusted deaths rather, uh, not only were disproportionate uh, with respect to uh, uh, to uh, minority populations, uh, but also by gender. Um, and these structural issues affected people by race, ethnicity, and gender as well. I'm gonna focus on New York City. What did we learn early in the pandemic? Well, we learned that housing mattered, right? Place matters. Residential inequality, where cities were concerned, meant that people living in more densely populated 
uh, less green open air, less recreational space, inferior access to health care uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am living and working in the Northwest Quadrant. If you know anything about Washington, D.C., the large majority of African-Americans in Washington, D.C., uh, or the, uh, the concentration of African-Americans in Washington, D.C., is not in the Northwest Quadrant, but in the Southeast Quadrant quadrant where there is one supermarket per 80,000 people uh, that is major supermarket chain, right? So these residential inequalities have not only to do with housing, housing stock, housing quality that expose one to disease, but they also have to do with the protective resources that could protect against disease. Uh, like I said, open space for exercise, access to healthcare, access to food, residential locations where Black and brown populations in New York uh, were prominent, uh, were those most hit uh, in, in the early part of the pandemic. Let's move on. Place matters not only to your housing, uh, but it also matters to your employment opportunities. Remember the plane again, uh, who has the better opportunity uh, for all the resources that life has to uh, distribute in order to enjoy health or the greatest health possible. Employment is another one of those resources that's very important. Again, data from New York. Employment inequality figured large in uh, concentrating the morbidity and mortality in black and brown populations in New York City and in other urban centers early in the pandemic. Why? In New York City, 30% of all bus drivers are black or brown. That's black or Latino. 20% of all food service workers, those that were doing DoorDash, that were stocking our shelves and making sure that those of us who were sheltering in place had food to eat were also minority population members. The people who had to ride public transportation in New York City, one quarter of them are black during all, excuse me, black and Latinx during uh, good times. That percentage skyrocketed during the pandemic and set the table, if you will, set the scene for increased exposure to COVID-19 disease. Let me also say um, that other resources such as education figure large into the inequality spectrum by race and do influence one's predisposition to the type of employment, the type of housing, the type of environment that you live in because educational inequality uh, uh, results in what we call uh, attainment gaps. Uh, another speech I'll talk to you about uh, the attainment gap being a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, this is mostly a resource cat but you'll see a little bit of on this slide. In New York, the inexperienced teachers are in predominantly black and Latino schools. Inequitable access to the quality of courses that prepare one for a college education are in, uh, uh, d disproportionately uh, prevalent. Those lacks, if you will, are disproportionately lack, uh, those deficits, if you will, are disproportionately located and concentrated in schools that serve minority neighborhoods. And as a result, an achievement gap unsurprisingly results. And this is connected to employment, is connected to housing, is connected to one's susceptibility to the disease. So when we say, as many have pointed out, that the racial disparities due to COVID-19 have to do with underlying comorbid conditions, uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. We must not forget that these comorbidities occur disproportionately in context, within a social context that makes employment, food access, recreation, healthcare, and other determinants of health much less available and much less accessible to minority populations. It is not only the disease itself, whether it's COVID-19, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, any of the other disease modalities, but it is also the resources to protect against the disease. The graph that you are looking at now shows the cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and full vaccination by race. So on the left, you see that in the Hispanic or Latino population, the gray line, which tells us which population has got full vaccination, and the yellow, red, and orange lines, which tell us which populations 
have got highest hospitalizations, death, and cases, uh, we see an inversion, right? We see an inversion. I'm going to circle it for you so that you can see more closely what I mean. There are three populations here where the line that tells us the group being described is fully vaccinated is below the lines that describe hospitalizations, deaths, and cases. That is not true for whites, but it is true for Asians, Blacks, and the Latino population. We don't have enough data yet. Only 53% of states are reporting race and ethnicity data so far. Here's the sad evidence from the COVID-19 pandemic. It is not only the disease, morbidity and mortality that is disproportionately affecting minority populations, but it is also the cure, the treatment, the vaccination that is disproportionately underserved and under distributed to these populations. Now we could live here for a while and I wouldn't get through the rest of my presentation, uh, but let's be clear about one thing. It is not vaccine hesitancy that is the explanation. We know that is not true. Now from studies such as been, uh, uh, has been uh, published by the Pew Research Foundation, that is data that has been published by the Pew Research Foundation, uh, another school of pharmacy, the Pittsburgh Dickinson School of Pharmacy. We know that blacks, Latinos, and whites all desire the vaccination in equal or relatively equal proportions. And so vaccine hesitancy is not the explanation. I submit to you that structural racism, structural inequality by race is the reason. Let me define this because the R word is so challenging for us. It drums up so many, uh, 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 so many ideas and maybe even a visceral reaction May I ask you, if I were there with you, I'd look you in the eye and say, would you go with me for a moment, uh, suspend your previous notions of what is meant by the term racism, what is meant by structural racism, and let me see if I can recalibrate your understanding. By racism, I don't mean bigots. I don't mean people or individuals who have negative attitudes. By racism, I mean a system of structuring opportunity, assigning value to individuals based on a hierarchy of their worth due to where they belong of the spectrum by race. Recall for a minute the definition of structural inequality. Structural racism, and I owe this definition to Kamara Jones, uh, a fine epidemiologist and physician, researcher, leader in health disparities research and uh, uh, at uh, the Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, I owe this definition of structural racism uh, to Dr. Jones. Structural racism does two things. One, it creates a hierarchical stratification of value based on this social construct called race. Two, it unfairly distributes opportunity and resources. Remember, this is the structural racism, uh, excuse me, the structural inequality theory that I started this discussion with you on. Now, looking at it specifically with respect to race, we can define structural racism as a system historically embedded, legally, as I will show you, embedded, enable a system of hierarchical preference that organizes an entire society, all of the institutions in society. Those that I've shown you with respect to COVID are a few. Housing, employment, education, institutionalized, by history and law to assign one, an inferior or superior status and two, an allocation of resources and power. This is structural racism. This is what I believe we must dismantle in order to achieve health equity. And there is good news. We can dismantle it just as President Wilson said in his introduction, in his kind introduction. We can dismantle it. Let me uh, take one detour. Um, if you're interested in looking into the theory and uh, the data concerning structural racism, uh, you will find uh, information uh, and lots of data supports this, that structural racism doesn't just harm uh, 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 marginalized populations, it harms us all. It harms us all. We have data to show that where we can measure 
racism, where we can measure this structural racism, and I'd have to talk to you about this in the Q&A if you're interested, we find that Blacks and whites die at a higher rate from myocardial infarction. We find that blacks and whites suffer higher degrees of infant mortality, albeit not at the same rate, but I want to convince you that structural racism harms us all and is worth us fighting. Let me turn to my own story now and show you structural racism in my life. Remember place matters, so this is the place I grew up. Uh, that house on the right, uh, the row house on the right, my family, uh, bought it uh, in the South Bronx, uh, which if you have seen any of those movies across 110th Street, uh, uh, you know the South Bronx is uh, quite a storied, difficult neighborhood. Um, the South Bronx has high crime rates, uh, low educational achievement, attainment, and all of the bad things that, uh, uh, that you read about uh, were true while I was growing up. Uh, but again, uh, place matters generally. Um, I had the good fortune of living in a family uh, that pooled its resources, several, uh, my mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, all got together to buy this house. Uh, it was $19,000 when they bought it in the South Bronx. And why I show it to you is because it made all the difference and you will see why place matters, remember that phrase. So um, I left the South Bronx um, and I'm gonna show you my two most recent moves. You heard from uh, President Wilson that I uh, moved in 2017 to this bucolic uh, uh, alma mater of mine, the University of Virginia Law School, uh, but my moving truck uh, that I showed you in the previous picture declined to take me on August the 10th, my moving day. Why? Because this would have been my welcome committee, right? On August 17, uh, 2017, excuse me, August 10, 2017, on the right, you see a bunch of uh, young men uh, who were chanting on the University of Virginia grounds, Jews will not replace us uh, into the oven. Jews will not replace us into the oven. That was their chant. Uh, a month before, uh, the uh, young men, uh, I, I guess this guy's actually not so young, uh, with the pointy hats and the Confederate flag, uh, they were there to welcome me also, and they tell me that Jews are Satan's children, uh, and they spell Bible, B-I-B-L-E-L. -E uh, here's what I want to be clear. They are the product of structural racism. We make a serious mistake if we think they are the racists and the only racists we have to worry about. They are the product, the outgrowth. They have permission to do what they have done. They have permission and feel enabled and empowered to express themselves in this way because the rest of us have tolerated structural racism. One more example, after I left the University of Virginia, I came here to the George Washington University. It's where I'm standing now, this beautiful picture of the law school I now have the honor and privilege to lead, uh, was down the block uh, two months ago from an outlandish expression of political violence uh, in the Capitol on one block, uh, well, a little over one block, uh, nearly a mile, away from the Capitol and the Proud Boys and the three percenters were marching right by my window in order to carry their Confederate flags um, and their t-shirts that said six million Jews are not enough into the nation's capital, into the nation's capital in order to tell us that we could not complete a democratically, a constitutionally manda mandated democratic uh, uh, a process. Uh, of counting electoral votes. We make a mistake if we think only these extremists are the racists of whom we must be afear, afraid. We make a mistake if we think that only these exceptional uh, Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck, uh, the vigilantes who shot down Ahmed Arbery, or even uh, Amy Cooper, uh, we make a mistake if we think that only these are the examples of structural racism. These are not systems. These are individuals empowered by systems that you and I can and must make equal if we intend to achieve health equity. This is how I feel some days when I think about the problem, but this is how I feel most days when I think about the problem. These are my fearsome characters from Wakanda that battle for justice. And I will dedicate the rest of my presentation today with reminding you that place matters and because it does, we can 
dismantle structural racism to eliminate health inequity and introduce health equity into the American health system. All right, remember place matters. So housing discrimination used to look like this. People overtly, expressly putting up signs. We don't see these kinds of signs anymore. I chose this because it was a Detroit, Michigan sign in February 1942 uh, that some uh, people who uh, we would say are racists uh, put up. Uh, that's overt, express racism. Uh, but racism became structural uh, before uh, uh, it, 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 it disappeared. Uh, it morphed, if you will. And by structural racism, uh, I'm giving you an example. Again, I'm gonna use my hometown for the next series of examples. Uh, we don't need signs like the one I just showed you from Detroit, 1942. In 1937, we redlined the South Bronx where my parents brought their home. What did that mean? That meant that the mortgage that they could get uh, was uh, the most unfavorable of terms. Why? Because the red line did not have only to do with geographic location or economic conditions. You see, with respect to the homeowners lending corporation, the narrative that was race related. Redlining had to do with race. It had to do with how many foreign born families, how many Negroes or spelled incorrectly, Puerto Ricans were in the area. The popula population is unstable. The more of these people that are in that population. What does that mean? That means we don't need the signs anymore. Segregation is embedded structurally in the home values in the South Bronx that we see today. This is a series of maps, uh, a map and a graph from 2018. Uh, the residential segregation that was established in 1937 by the redlining that affected my parents' purchase of their home where I grew up continues today to define and set the tone for the median household income where in the South Bronx today. So this is a map on the left of New York City and the highest incomes are in dark green, the lowest incomes are in light green. Where are they located? In the South Bronx where my house is, that area that was redlined in 1937. We don't need a map. We don't need a, excuse me, we don't need a sign. We don't need a bigot. We have structurally embedded decreased income, decreased home values, so that the zip codes with the lowest median income in the Bronx include those that were redlined in 1937. We do not need a sign that says, you're not welcome in this school in order to create disproportionately high exposure to the kind of pollution that is located predominantly in black and brown neighborhoods where in the South Bronx in New York City. That is why New York City is called Asthma Alley, because of the proximity of truck routes, industrial sites, and other uh, uh, trash waste uh, uh, sites uh, to schools in, uh, in the South Bronx. Now, when you compare this to the neighborhoods in the rest of New York, that proximity changes. Even next to hospitals, we see these industrial uh, sites. The site of school desegregation in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957 featured express racism. People yelling at a young black woman coming to go to high school and integrate uh, a high school in Little Rock for the first time. We don't need that kind of overt racism anymore. Why? Because we have structurally relegated poor schools poor quality schools and high crime rates in neighborhoods that are concentrated uh, uh, with black and brown people. And I will say also low income white people, uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, I, I, as you heard in the introduction was uh, one of the places that uh, I concentrated on a very great deal when I worked for, uh, in my view, the terrific Debbie Stabenow um, and uh, was there uh, at the declaration of the, uh, uh, of the lead water crisis. Uh, these are areas that suffer uh, disproportionately from older homes, from older lead lines, from high crime, from uh, poor public school quality. And remember the COVID example told us this was a precondition. The social conditions were a precondition to the underlying comorbidities that created the health disparities that we see today in the pandemic and across many disease modalities. Let me also say, that food disparities don't require the kind of 
overt, ugly racism that we saw in this photograph when a group of black and white teenagers sought to integrate a lunch counter and were met with an angry mob throwing milk and ketchup and mustard on them, calling them racial epithets and telling them they weren't wanted. We don't need that kind of overt racism anymore because we have structurally relegated people of the South Bronx for an exemplar, but Detroit, Michigan, Providence, Rhode Island, Harlem, USA, New Haven, Connecticut, we could go across the globe. And the story I am telling you about this place, my home, my place mattering, will be replicated across the United States. Here we see the proportion of respondents to a survey saying they did not have enough food to eat in the last two weeks. Where's that concentration? In the South Bronx. Compare it in the center map to the lighter colored, lighter shaded areas throughout New York City. The dark shaded areas are those that were redlined in 1937. Again, institutionalizing obesity, right? If food deserts or swamps, as some cause them, are prevalent in neighborhoods like the South Bronx, we can expect obesity. We can expect that people who cannot find green vegetables, except for at, at the odd farmer's market or at a food bank on a regular basis, like I described Southeast uh, Washington, DC, will eat from the unhealthy convenience stores and obesity will result. These are not surprising outcomes. Again, we don't need this historic horror of lynching that is shown on the right in order to have criminal justice disparities, another social determinant of health, another reason that place matters, right? When there are wide criminal disparities, my assertion is that health disparities uh, result. So here we see the arrest rate for mar marijuana possession by race. You heard in the introduction that I spent 15 years in the uh, state of Colorado. Uh, so I, I, I can tell you a little bit about the data, only the data, uh, with respect to marijuana um, uh, uh, arrests. Uh, now, you might not think this is very um, uh, momentous, right? Uh, that there's a difference between black arrests, the uh, uh, light blue, tall lines, and white arrests, the short ones. Uh, but you must see how that compares to the prevalence of use of marijuana. On the left, you see that from 2001 to 2014, and I actually have data that goes all the way to 2018, the prevalence of use of marijuana among adults in the last year, um, six months uh, as well, uh, and two weeks as well, is very close. These two lines between black and white populations are almost identical by 2018. And yet we see a wide disparity in the arrest rate for marijuana violations or possession by race. This is structural racism. Why does it change? Let me pause here just to say, I am the mother of three. My mental health is intimately tied to the fear that my child, when 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, might be arrested or might be stopped by the police um, and not have the kind of ready answers that I train them, yes sir, no sir, polite demeanor that I train them um, and find themselves on the wrong side of these statistics because of the color of their skin. Now that affects not only my child, but it affects me. Every one of us as parents fear our children going out for that first drive when they're 16 years old. I have another layer and that is this disparity of criminal justice enforcement. That changes my allostatic load, it changes my uh, health responses um, uh, and it is one of the reasons that inequality produces health disparities. What can we do? Pharmacies, I would suggest, are key to what I'm going to call a quiet revolution. I call it a quiet revolution because you did not ever see marches that required fierce dogs or hoses, as we saw in Birmingham, turned on protesters marching for their civil rights in order to achieve hospital and healthcare desegregation. Instead, you saw a quiet revolution. Exemplified here by the Medical Committee on Civil Rights March marching in 1964. In another lecture, I will tell you the intimate and integral relationship between law and medicine in creating the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we have, that I suggest to you is key, essential, to this quiet revolution that we need to happen again in order to achieve uh, health equity. I suggest to you that pharmacies and pharmaceutical 
colleges and pharmacists are at the center of a potential second quiet revolution to achieve health equity in the United States uh, without bloodshed, uh, without violence, uh, but again, through a marriage of law, policy, and health. How could it be? Well, pharmacists on the front line of providing access to health care. This is one of the success stories of our time even today. West Virginia is one of the states, Alaska is another, that have used the network of pharmacies in incredibly effective ways to distribute vaccine broadly across their populations, experiencing much less of the disparity that I showed you in the structural racism part of my presentation earlier. The access to over 60,000 pharmacies in the United States in a variety of settings, the fact that more people have relationship and frequently see their pharmacists than they see their primary care providers means that pharmacists can improve health outcomes at a lower cost at a broader penetration throughout society, probably than any other of the health care providers in our health system. The workforce potential, that is if pharmacies and pharmaceutical colleges and schools like this fine institution were to take seriously the charge of integrating, of uh, diversifying uh, full-time workforce, full-time faculty and students, the number of people who would be able to penetrate those neighborhoods in those 60,000 pharmacies and relate culturally, establish relationships and peer dyads with patient populations would increase because of your work. Now, I understand the threats to pharmacies. I understand that in 2018, you have seen your annual sales decline. I have understanding of the fact that the gross profit margins are smaller. And I understand that this is an industry with very complex and very difficult uh, challenges from uh, uh, third party contracts and other uh, types of, of sources. But I maintain still that you have an inordinate amount of influence on the healthcare system, on access to healthcare, and the fact that independent pharmacies are a 75.8 billion dollar marketplace suggests to me that if you chose to have an influence on the structural inequalities that I have described throughout this presentation, the workers, 200,000 full-time workers anchoring in instant in communities uh, would have a dramatic effect. Other effects would include if you paid very intentional uh, uh, played very close attention uh, to the diversity of those who are in clinical trials. Uh, if you established research partnerships with HBCUs, uh, if you advocated for drug pricing uh, that was need-based, uh, but there's something else that you can do now. And this will require one more detour. I have talked throughout this uh, discussion about law and why it's important. I wanna make the case and I'll go straight for the uh, punchline. I wanna make the case that you in this audience, you at Wayne State uh, Pharmaceutical College uh, right now have an obligation, an opportunity. I won't say an obligation, I'll say an opportunity now. Uh, the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmaceutical Science has an opportunity to consider yourselves deputized, not only for the types of interventions that I've discussed, uh, but for advocacy, advancing civil rights equality under the law. Here's why it's important. If I asked you to show your hands and tell me whether you know what the 13th Amendment says, everyone would likely raise their hand and say, it is the amendment that made slavery unconstitutional. You must know, as my constitutional law students know, however, that it was not the original 13th Amendment. The original 13th Amendment did the exact opposite. It's, it is uh, the language that you see here on the screen. The original 13th Amendment, in fact, constitutionalized slavery. It would have made it impossible for Congress to abolish or interfere with any state's practice of the peculiar institution of owning human beings. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the law makes all the difference. This version of the 13th Amendment, this version of the Constitutional Amendment was not just a historic 
uh, uh, sort of footnote. This version that would have constitutionalized slavery uh, garnered the requisite two thirds vote in the House of Representatives uh, uh, just before the Civil War in 1861. It garnered the requisite two thirds votes in the Senate and went on to the ratification process. Six states ratified this version of the 13th Amendment. We only don't know whether it would have become the constitutional amendment instead of the one that we have. Why? Because the Civil War started. It was firing on Fort Sumter that interrupted this process. But before it did, the great emancipator, uh, Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, spoke with approbation about this original version of the 13th Amendment. I say that because the law changes everything. It changes everything for the good as well as for the bad. And a marriage between law and medicine is symbolized in this landmark case, Simpkins v. Cohn. Again, another lecture, let's suffice it to say, this is the watershed case that led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This plus the committee that I showed you marching in the quiet revolution was a case that challenged segregation in the Moses H. Cohn Memorial Hospital in North Carolina. The result of this case was 7,000 hospitals were ultimately desegregated. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, not five, I'm sorry for that typo, 64, was enacted and who started it? Six physicians, three dentists and two patients. This is why I'm convinced that those of you here at the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmaceutical Science have a part to play in eradicating the health disparities that are recorded in this Institute of Medicine consensus report that have been replicated throughout the literature, uh, you have the power to address the social determinants of health that I've talked about from a civil rights law perspective. I encourage you to take the charge to do all that I said pharmacies could do, touching patients, distributing healthcare, integrating clinical trials, but also please consider it your opportunity, even your obligation to lead the second quiet revolution by fighting for civil rights and equality in all of the social determinants of health, in, in, in education, in housing, in the environment, in voting, it matters. And it will produce true health equity if we all work together I believe it is possible. So thank you very much for listening and I will stop sharing now and look forward to our discussion. Oh, Dean Lysak, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Let me see if that's my fault. Thank you, technology. I know we all uh, join together in saying thank you for an impassioned, uh, logical, uh, justified, and inspiring talk. Thank you so much. And can I jump right into questions from Please our do. Please do. There's a great one right here from Isaac Atik. What kind of a shift do you believe is necessary to overcome disparity of criminal justice enforcement as it relates to race. Is this going to take a cultural shift in the nation, a change in laws, a change in training for officers or a combination? A combination for sure. Um, uh, I believe that social norms are set by society, by people like you and me. Uh, the law follows the social norms. It very rarely leads, right? So when I talk to my law students, I say, the law is sort of the ethical floor and the rest of us are, 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 are way above that, right? And so it will take us all beginning conversations that are not usually thought of health related conversations uh, that talk about inequalities in our criminal justice system that need to be addressed uh, by community review boards of policing actions that need to be uh, reviewed uh, by policies that uh, set qualified immunities, uh, that need to be reviewed uh, by watching and paying attention uh, to trials such as the Derek Chauvin trial that's going on. Uh, we know that those who consider themselves grassroots activists are paying attention. 
uh, that they are kneeling and praying. Uh, why leave it only to them, right? Why not create an environment uh, where the social norm is to talk about our criminal justice system as a social determinant of health? All of us are engaged in this conversation together. Thank you. I think as faculty, as we're speaking to our students across the college at the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, we're such a breadth of professions. And as you suggested, at the front lines, one of your first actions must be not to be silent, but to speak. Um, the message I'm hearing from you, uh, Dean Matthew, is we stand by and we stand to the side waiting for someone else. And my question to you is that line between activism and prof how do I want to put this? this? This sense, particularly for younger students, I would say, that feel there's a track of professional obligation. But if you step here, you're out of your role. You're, you've crossed into activism. And yet, the older I get, the more I think activism is the way forward. Do you have thoughts on that? I certainly do. Um, and my thoughts come from the experience I heard, had working in Debbie Stabenow's office. Debbie Stabenow is, as you've heard, I'm a fan, an outstanding senator, and part of the reason that she's outstanding is because she will listen to any one of her constituents who wants to speak to her. So when I was a health policy fellow, my job was to take half hour appointments from people from Michigan who would knock on the door and say, I wanna, I wanna talk, I want the senator to hear what I have to say. I promise you that she heard the summary of every single conversation I ever took um, in our Monday morning meetings, but I also promise you this, when those meetings were with health professionals, she listened especially closely. Your voice, your knowledge, your ability to quantify the adverse impact of inequality in a way that is tangibly evidence-based for policymakers to react to. Everybody does not have to march. Everybody does not have to be an activist. I'm asking everyone to figure out where your place in the answer, in the solution to health equity, to achieving health equity, to removing unjust, avoidable, and unfair barriers is located. Is it going down to Debbie Stabenow's office and quietly advocating for fair housing? Is it joining the conversation with Dr. Mona Hanna Atish about the presence of lead, elevated blood levels in her patients? Is it advocating for a new supermarket? Is it writing prescriptions uh, for uh, decreased price or advocating for decreased need-based pricing? Uh, is it sitting on an admissions committee and making sure that the body of students that you have reflect the diversity of the population you hope to serve? Is it sitting on an appointments committee and understanding that unless we admit a diverse faculty to, sh to, to mentor and be role models for a diverse population of professionals, we are not going to produce the kind of workforce that can solve health disparities. There is a broad range of points of entry. And all I ask of you is to recognize, number one, that each of us has a part to play. And number two, there is no lane that's called just health. I like it very much. Thank you. It's a, it's, it's a deep team with ranges of expertise and opportunity, and we need each and every one uh, loud and clear. So agree. Let me ask a question um, uh, that Dr. Rich Lucarotti, the uh, our fine associate dean for pharmacy who so engaged you and you so entranced him, I think a year ago in, in your national talk uh, that he was able to bring you to us, has asked. And Rich is asking, can you comment on how to incorporate the social determinants of health and health equity into inter professional education, and can you see how we could put law students 
with health profession students, bring them together on these matters to influence future public policy? Ah, perfect question. I belong to an organization called Beyond Flexner, looking at the education of health professionals in a more integrated manner. Uh, the idea that you propose is outstanding. Um, I think that bringing the public health model, uh, the population uh, preventative model to all of the health professions educational systems is step one. Uh, we don't need to educate any uh, longer in the siloed fashion of uh, just creating a, a healthcare system. Uh, that's actually a sickness system where we wait until people are ill and then we uh, propose therapies. I don't know if you've seen that diagram of catching people off of a cliff. Uh, we need to educate our students far upstream uh, for interventions far upstream. This will require the kind of public health orientation and the kind of integrated educational model uh, that Rich, you're describing. Wouldn't it be excellent if our law students and uh, pharmacy students uh, together began to think about the kind of legislation that will change drug pricing. Uh, and in doing so, informed one another, law students sharing concepts of equal protection and equal justice under the law and what the tools are to achieve that. Pharmaceutical students sharing the limitations of recovering return on investment for uh, uh, research and design. And those two professional groups informing one another to create solutions. Suppose they went together to Senator Stapanow's office and say, we have a bill to propose. It is evidence-based. It is likely to have a, uh, we have uh, done some uh, research trials that show us a diverse population is improved by these outcomes. Don't you think we'd have better legislation if those students educated together were actually advocating health equity policies together? I couldn't agree more. And as uh, the interim dean of the college right now, I can assure you that uh, our students are at the front lines across the health professions, and it's the greatest place to be. It's such a privilege as a healthcare professional and a student becoming a healthcare professional to have the opportunity to listen and learn and appreciate where the patient comes from in terms of their historical place, as you so beautifully presented and stuck in our mind, and then to be inspired to work together for positive social change. Uh, you've provided a great infusion and fuel to that energy at, at our college. Are there any further comments that you would like to make at this time, Dr. Bowen? Bowen Matthew, excuse me, before That's we quite all right. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you once again. It really is an honor for a lawyer to be invited into a conversation with scientists, clinicians, and researchers who care about health equity enough to engage someone completely outside of their discipline. I'm honored to be here. I thank you for the invitation and thank you for the opportunity to be with you. It's an absolute pleasure. And I hope someday we might have you on site. And you've left me so curious about the impact of your mother, your father, your grandparents, and how you came from one two, two to three to four. I think uh, like President Wilson, I'll be following your career closely and if we can be of assistance in Detroit in your fight for civil rights and health equity, we are standing with you. And again, thank you so, so much for your inspiring presentation. Thank you, Dean Lysak, very much. Our time has come to an end, but this topic obviously will continue to be a key motivator here at the college and at Wayne State University. To all of our attendees, I hope this event will inspire you to take action towards social justice in everything you do in healthcare, and dare I say, every day. Those actions can be small or big. And as Dean Matthew has just inspired us and reminded us and instructed us, every small bit matters. I know that all of our students, soon to be practitioners, will play a critical role in alleviating health disparities here in Detroit 
and at the college and Wayne State University and the college is here to support you all of the way. Again, Dean Matthew, thank you so much for shaping, sharing your wisdom, excuse me, and ideas with us today. It's a pleasure to meet you virtually and a warm, warm thank you from Detroit, Wayne State and the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Thank you again so much. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. It was a pleasure to be with you for this very important and enjoyable Martin Barr, Stephen Wilson lecture. Thank you.